Moving Flint Forward Fund is a fund that was established by our chamber. It's an economic development fund. It is meant primarily to help small businesses and minority owned businesses in North Flint. So um, that is a fund that we know another half million is coming in, so we're excited that that fund is beginning to grow. Car, car Cares for, uh, Fund for Flint is actually a donor advised fund, which means um, and Brandon has plans to really build that fund. It means he will be a play an active role advising grants related to the water crisis that he, um, however he wants to have impact as long as it has charitable purpose. And then the Lynx Incorporated Fund is one that was established by our local chapter of Lynx. It also is a donor advised fund. They are about to launch a nationwide campaign with all Lynx chapters across the US and then they will use that to advise grants pretty much in alignment with what the Flint Kids Fund is trying to do. It's just one more resource where um, we can bring about the kind of interventions that are really important. Um, the water related grants to date, these are the grants that we have made. Most of them relate to nutrition, which we understand to be the, um, the most immediate response that we we can organize. So you can see expansion of Meet Up and Eat Up, expansion of healthy cooking demonstrations, um, promoting urban gardening and doing testing for lead in soil, uh, a big expansion of the Double Up Food Bucks, so it's very exciting in our community. And then um, a grant to the Hurley Foundation for their Nurse Family Partnership Program Again, one of the most important interventions we can possibly do is to connect pregnant or young moms with a caring health professional who will stay with her through that child's second birthday. We consider that a really high priority. And also, um, we have given a, a grant to Virginia Tech to support Dr. Mark Edwards' um, work. We believe that restoring the faith and trust of the Flint people is the most important work we have. And we are hoping that Dr. Edwards, who is seen as an independent voice, will be able to play a role as we restore water quality. We have an advisory committee that makes the decisions around these grants. Um, I want to acknowledge Dr. Lawrence Reynolds is our, the chair of our Flint Child Health and Development Advisory Committee. And we have a number of Flint residents and other health professionals. Dr. Mona also serves on that committee. And these are the individuals that are reviewing the requests that come to us and making those tough decisions about what we can fund and what we have to pass on. If people are interested in funding, um, as I say, we have a variety of funds. The first step is always to call the community foundation and ask to speak with the program officer. Um, we need to be able to have that first conversation to say whether it's even worth the effort. Is, do we have a fund that is a good fit with the need? And then the program officer will help them navigate the system in order to put in a funding request and bring it for um, review and decision. And I now open to any kind of questions that you might have. Well, we want to thank you, Ms. Horton, for doing that, and certainly uh, Mr. Jones for suggesting that you come and present here. So, uh, Sylvester, you have any comments on this? I do. Let me um, begin by saying thank you to Ms. Kathy Horton for um, making herself available to um, make a presentation to this body about um, certainly the, the background and the history of the Community Foundation, but more importantly in this space, to really talk about how they're managing um, resources and donations that are coming to the Community Foundation and Flint overall to help Flint to recover from this water crisis. Um, I would be remiss if I did not say that, um, well, one, I, I've known um, Ms. Kathy Horton for a very long time, and she's um, always been a, um, an amazing leader in my eyes and someone that I have a tremendous amount of love and respect for. 
Um, I would say that her presentation today um, answers three very important questions. And if I could, it, it, it answers this question that I've heard a number of people say is what is Flint doing to help Flint? And so I think what you heard from Mrs. Kathy Horton is that a number of people who made contributions and um, Flint's own Brandon Carr has established two funds to help to support um, Flint residents as they attempt to, um, to recover from this water crisis. The other question that I believe her presentation answers, and we've heard this on a number of, in a number of spaces from a number of people is, um, that all important question of where is the money going, right? And a number of people are asking the question um, as if someone has a, um, someone at the mayor's office has a, 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 a lockbox with the money in and it holding on to it. So it answers that question of where the money is going and also how the money is being um, spent to help Flint people. So I think that presentation um, really helps to answer that question. But the third question that I believe that her presentation answers, and I've been watching the faces around the room, and I know that all of you are saying, what can I do individually to help Flint, right? What can I do to help Flint? So this is that opportunity for you to run over to Ms. Kathy Horton after the meeting is over and say, I wanna make a personal contribution to the Community Foundation of Greater Flint to help Flint because I know they're doing amazing work and I know the Flint people really need and will appreciate that. So um, this answers that question for everybody that wants to make that personal contribution to establish your own fund to help Flint. I mean, get in line and I know Mrs. Kathy Horton will be uh, very happy to support your, your efforts. So thank you, Ms. Kathy Horton, for this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Any questions from the committee? Dr. Sullivan. I also want to thank you very much. <clears throat> you answered a lot of the questions that I have and a lot of questions that I've been asked by members of the community. Um, I, I feel in an awkward position sometimes because um, uh, I'm asked by members of the community to push things forward that I feel are maybe not reasonable or maybe very difficult to ask. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm absolutely certain that the decision-making team that's putting together how grants are funded and where money's going are qualified for that and have, have the kind of credentials that everybody would want. And, um, and I'm, uh, I guess I must say, troubled by the request by many members of the community that they have some direct involvement in that kind of decision-making pro process because I know that they, that they probably lack that um, and so as you're making a presentation, I'm struggling with how can, how can I answer their need by, while at the same time recognize what great work you're doing. And so here's my, here's my request. Would it be possible in light of, of uh, Sylvester's re most recent suggestion, if I made a donation to the Flint Community Foundation uh, with, with uh, the request that there'd be a way of tracking my donation through the process. Who saw it, Who? what did they do, um, as a way to maybe demonstrate to the residents that are working with me um, with, with real dollars and with real names, what happens in that process. And then I can sit down with them having made that donation and having equal concern maybe about what, how's that money is being used and say, this is, what, this is what they told me, this is how it was used, look here, here, some of it went here, so, you know, obviously this might be representative, but um, I, I, I just, I have, I'm at a loss as to how to help residents of Flint who fear that, um, well, for example, that uh, all we're doing is getting good food to children and what about me? You know, those kinds of comments. Um, that maybe there might be a way to bring more of them into a more collaborative role and encourage them toward the, the, um, the grant process for their neighborhoods so that rather than folding their arms and saying this isn't right and there's nothing good about it and I'm not even gonna participate, maybe introducing them back into that process. Would, would that be possible? 
Um, I think that's a really novel and creative idea. It's one we're certainly open to, but I want to kind of go on the record to say I really understand why residents are suspicious or um, feeling all the more disenfranchised. So Thank you. I, I understand that. We know we can't at the Community Foundation just do business as usual. So we consider ourselves a fairly transparent right. organization, but it's not enough. Our normal practice that we do is not enough for the environment that we're in. And we, the, the honest um, answer is we've been overwhelmed just receiving this generosity. Sure. We, we are still the same size staff we were in December and we right. you know we've been stretched to the max but we know we must soon take extra steps to, for us to get out into the community and we have lots of relationships to do that as I said we've got 40 block clubs and neighborhood associations who love us who Over know community. us yeah. and who could become allies for us in terms of communicating more effectively, more comprehensively to the community. So mm -hmm. I'm very open to that, Dr. Thank Sullivan, you. but I, I want you to know we've had conversation with the NAACP national president to say we need help on this. Right. This is not work that we know how to do quickly. And he's um, said that they will help us formulate a more comprehensive approach to really getting effective Thank information you. out to residents. And that's something we're very committed to. A and the other thing is I want to comment on your, um, how you talked about bringing uh, these things home to make an acknowledgement. I think of all of the things that you talked about, to me as a, as a resident and as somebody who's dealing with residents, that that just that little story says a lot about that this is that this is very personal and um, I, I want to thank you for adding that note thanks dr. Sullen and thank you uh, miss Horton any other questions okay we're gonna move to the next section and that is uh, a brief discussion on the Flint water after or excuse me Flint water action task force report uh, you received uh, in your materials, uh, some recommendations in terms of how we would like to process uh, these steps. And I'm going to run through a couple of slides for you. If you can go to the next slide here. Um, the, the task force recommendation report basically is designed to serve as a guiding document to manage the expectations and to provide guidelines and a template to develop complete recommendations. And that's why we disperse those um, those recommendations out to you. We will also facilitate the development of, uh, of a thorough and consistent supplementary uh, deliverables to, uh, to this, this particular committee. Uh, next slide. We have a timeline that we're proposing uh, to get this stuff done. And um, we assign uh, these recommendations to the committee. That's done. Uh, we want to establish a schedule uh, and would like to have that basically done before the uh, the next meeting of uh, this committee uh, so I'll be reaching out to the committee chairs to get their schedules done uh, have that evaluated draft recommendations uh, then we'll have to have those uh, recommendations brought before the committee for uh, review um, and then we want to publish a final report according to this particular timeline that you received we're looking at uh, July, mid-July for being uh, done with this about July 22nd would be a, a good target for us to have that report to the governor uh, from uh, this, uh, this body. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask Scott if he can go into a little bit more details of this and then uh, Scott, you can just keep going with your second part. Okay, Harvey, can do. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of some of the more uh, detailed instructions, and, and again, the, uh, that particular guidance document that came out from Stacy um, through, uh, through Harvey, um, this, this gets into more of a deeper dive. A, a key for the subcommittees is there's a template on the final page of that document for each subcommittee to, to use. And, and as Harvey already mentioned, that's, that's really to provide consistent feedback uh, in terms of just from a process perspective. 
So what will happen is those, uh, as, as you, the subcommittees prepare those draft recommendations, then those will come into the FWIC to each of the members <coughs> of the FWIC for a review process. And again, uh, as, as we look for the feedback from the FWIC members, that'll be important um, that that comes in. And then those co-chairs will consolidate that and then give all that feedback back to the subcommittee for the subcommittee to review and for consideration. Um, and then that subcommittee, as they, as they, they may, update the recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. And then based upon those recommendations, they may publish a, 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 final, um, a final document to the FWIC members for either final review or, or that subcommittee will go ahead and present the final, their final subcommittee recommendations to the FWIC in its entirety and request a, uh, and request, uh, potentially a motion for approval. Um, from that approval process then, uh, those recommendations will either be, either be, if it is approved by the FWIC to go forward, it'll be submitted to the governor's office for final consideration or, or potentially return for any clar clarification from a, uh, any questions that may, may come up. And then that subcommittee will then have to uh, review what comes back and then either make modifications um, and bring it back to the FWIC uh, for a final motion for approval. Um, and at which point that'll then conclude the FWIC's role for that particular subcommittee itself. Um, and again, a, a lot's predicated on, on what the recommendation is and the FWIC uh, in its entirety, that ultimate approval. Uh, and, and then that moves, if you go to the next slide, that'll then get to the governor's office for, um, for uh, to, be, to be staffed. And so depending upon what action needs to be done, we'll then guide the, if, if it's an executive action, then that'll be, um, that, that'll be managed through, through the governor's office. If it needs to go from a legislative perspective or funding or some sort of regulatory change, that will be advocated or advanced through the governor's office from an advocacy, advocacy perspective. Um, Harvey, that concludes my remarks on that subject to questions. Okay, so uh, any questions, uh, uh, Sylvester? Okay, so if we go back to page three of three, my question is, can I um, request that a couple bullets be added to this page, um, one of which would be to make a presentation to the Flint City Council so that they hear directly from this committee about the recommendations that will be presented to the governor and, uh, and if possible, to make that either a part of a regular city council meeting or a special meeting. And the other one is, you know, we could um, have an opportunity to have a dialogue. One of the things that I've advocated for is that dialogue between, you know, the, the FWIC committee as well as the, the administration on how do we go forward with this, recognizing that um, there will be um, recommendations that are likely to have a direct impact on how the city does its work going forward so um, so making a recommendation for two additional bullets to be added there um, and certainly the City Council may have some other thoughts on that but at least those two I think that's those are good recommendations council president or uh, council vice president any comments on that especially with the management plan that it has been discussed. The, the problem is trying to get everybody together at the same time so we can receive that training and then start identifying what strategies need to happen next. Lieutenant Governor, you have a seat right here. Next <laughs> 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 no, no, sure. go ahead. Dr. Sullivan. Uh, my comment is very much along the same lines as Sylvester's. I was wondering if, uh, on the same page, if um, in, in this process, if there was a point at which it went directly to the mayor uh, for her comment, for her clarification, just as it ultimately goes to the governor. A absolutely. Uh, and and again, just for clarification, the mayor is a member of this committee. Um, for the county representatives, would it be helpful for the same kind of presentation be made to the commission? 
Yeah, I think it would. Okay, so we can add those two. Uh, any other comments on this? Okay, um, just Harvey, just a mechanical oh question. Yeah. Uh, there's 44 recommendations that have been parceled out to a variety of policy committees. Are you looking for the policy committees to, with the schedule we're developing, deal with everything assigned to them at one point in one report? Do you want it parsed out? How do you want it done? I prefer it to be parsed out okay. um, because that way we can move. Some committees will move faster. Right. Uh, so if we can get get it done, we can parse it out. Now, when we get the final report, that I think it, we can come to the city council and the uh, county commission. So we not we're not doing several meetings with those two bodies. Um, but I prefer that. I mean, and I, that's just my preference. But any, if there are any other comments around the table, let's uh, let's have that discussion. Just so I'm clear on the expectations. For example, the policy subcommittee has about 12 of the 44 assigned to it. Mm -hmm. You want that as one report from the yes. subcommittee? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And by the way, uh, uh, Mike Simmer then will be managing a lot of this process. So, uh, just just FYI to you, <laughs> since you have the most recommendations, Mike. Um, <laughs> so, any other comments on this? Um, so we're we're going to expedite this and get it done. This is one of the charges of the uh, of this committee from from the executive order. And we just want to hold true to that. Uh, with that, there are also other um, updates that the subcommittees have been working on uh, that would go as a part of the incident action plan. And so sometime in June, just expect for us to uh, ask the subcommittee chairs to provide that update on other things that are outside the 44 recommendations. And so when you're prepared for that, we can begin to wrap up the work of this body. Uh, with that, uh, Scott, you the other uh, yes, sir. So in terms of the uh, the interim PMO at this point, so I just wanted to give a brief update as to uh, as to how that's moving forward. Um, we've worked with all the state level departments to identify their interim uh, interim PMs, and um, and they understand at this point that they're responsible for tracking their departmental goals, um, I should say tasks, objectives, and their supporting goals. We conducted our second meeting with those state agencies this week. Our first one was last Wednesday. We have a, a schedule where we meet every Wednesday with the interim PMs, and um, it was a very effective meeting um, where those uh, those interim PMs reported out on all their departmental um, updates. And we focused that the the discussion on at, at the objective level, um, and this approach was successful, really in, in promoting a lot of uh, interagency cross talk communication and. and uh, that, that overall shared shared understanding that we're all looking to achieve. Um, PMs at the, at the state level have also developed and nominated their their draft key outcome key outcome indicators. Um, those are those are still being uh, being flushed out, but we we had a good discussion at, at our at our Wednesday meeting. The next step uh, as we as we had that crosstalk in the room was that those agencies were going to take those those respective key key outcome indicators back to their to their departments um, staff those one more time and then the next step is those will go those will come forward to the governor's executive office for for discussion um, because those are the, the state's key outcome indicators at this point from a, a dashboard perspective I've talked a lot about dashboard at these meetings as well and so I have an update for you there um, we met with reps from the uh, from DTMB that manage the current Michigan dashboard system, MI dashboard, uh, and that platform, that, that particular platform uses uh, a system called Socrata. Um, we've been working with the respective DTMB folks to, uh, to, ref uh, to refine this as a recommended course of action. Um, we feel that it probably offers the most flexibility as well as, uh, as, well as speed at this point, but there's a few items that, we're, that we still have to flesh out with, uh, with our friends from DTMB before we can come come forward with a firm and final overall recommendation. And last but certainly not least, we had, we've had a series of key, key meetings with the city, um, with members of the city, I should say, um, in, in terms of uh, our attendance at the Flint, at the mayor's uh, Flint water response team, as well as um, we had members from the city council at that particular meeting as well. At that meeting, we briefed the, the action task tracker, as we call it, and what that is is that's that is the, the overall PMO synchronization tool that we're currently using. Um, and we provided an update to the, to the mayor's team on the overall PMO process. Um, at the request of that response team, uh, we, had, we conducted a separate meeting with, uh, 
the consultant that was engaged by the Flint water response team. Um, and, and so we met with him uh, actually yesterday and we gave him a deep dive on that action task tracker to explain and, and share with him where, where all of the tasks are to date in terms of the, the uh, actions. Uh, so we've had a lot of strong progress in the last two weeks since I last briefed you and uh, that concludes my update subject to any questions. Any questions for Colonel Hipsko? Dr. Sullivan. Who was that consultant that you mentioned in your last bullet? Uh, that's someone that's been engaged by the uh, by the mayor's Flint water response team. Uh, Lauren Madden is the name um, out of um, Accenture. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, we're, we're spot right on time. Um, just the next meeting uh, for this body will be June 10th, so you have a break. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the interim, uh, we'll be pushing the subcommittees for those updates. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll get the work done in the interim and we'll uh, come back uh, with updates on June 10th uh, and Mackinac's in between that. And so we'll see a lot of you up there probably on the island. So we'll probably have some sidebar conversations on this. And with that, um, uh, Captain Kalinske, you have any other additions? Uh, no, sir. All right. Um, Governor, uh, close out. Well, thank you for a good meeting today. I appreciate the discussions. This was very helpful. I appreciate the community foundations. Community foundations play a critically important role, and it's great to see, in particular, the role during this crisis that your organization is playing and um, how many people are already participating in that process. And, and I appreciate the, Mr. Jones' comment about actually doing an ask. It's only good when you have a community foundation. You get an ask on the table every meeting. So, very good. Well, thank you. Well, that kind of generosity is how you solve problems. So, that's great. Well, I appreciate all that. Um, the extra item that we're adding today is something that I think is important and actually uh, it was great we had the discussion about the uh, Flint Water Task Force report. I appreciate the task force work. Dr. Reynolds was a key part of that. Um, and we're doing the follow-up work now through the FWIC. Um, I'm not sure who has the health and health subcommittee, but in terms of work being done, um, Nick, I'm glad to report that you're going to have an easier work because one of those recommendations is getting done today. Um, so it's nice. Number eight, you can check off your list um, in terms of complete, which was an important um, recommendation. Um, some years ago, from basically 2006 through 2010, um, there was a state commission that was on the topic of childhood lead prevention. Um, I believe it was statutory and it had a sunset, so it disappeared. Um, we think it's appropriate to reestablish that in terms of the recommendations of the task force. So what I'm doing today um, through executive order is essentially creating a new um, child-led poisoning elimination board. Um, so in terms of not just talking about prevention, but how we can eliminate um, lead for children. And so I'm looking forward to moving forward with this. Um, actually, I have the executive order here. Um, so we have a little more pomp and circumstance than normal. I'm going to sign this executive order as part of this session um, so we can move it forward. Um, I'm glad to see some smiles, particularly from our physician members, uh, to see this action taking place. This is a statewide effort, um, and it's to come out and create a, a board that will have 12 members. It's to give a report by November. Um, it's to focus in on all the key steps, I believe, of this process, including how do we get more children tested for lead, how do we do better follow-up with that? How do we do better programming to eliminate the risk factors, do investigations and such, and then do better data and reporting of information and transparency of that information statewide? So I look forward to that. I'm pleased to be joined by the upcoming chair of that organization who's sitting next to me, the lieutenant governor. Um, I couldn't think of anyone else better to chair this board. 
um, because he's had a tremendously successful track record of chairing other initiatives on important topics such as mental health and disabilities in our state. So it will be in very good hands and I know a number of people will be interested in participating in this process. So I look forward to moving forward with this. So let's make some action happen. So with that, if you can bear with me while I open this up and uh, you can witness my poor penmanship, um, we'll get this commission established. And as I go through this process, um, I would like to turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor to actually make a few comments, um, given that he now has this additional responsibility. Well, thank you, Governor, and, and uh, thank you to the members of this uh, of this body and those who uh, came before to, to put this recommendation uh, in, in front of the, um, in, in really in front of the state and, and, to, and to challenge a new and very bold initiative to, uh, to go further than the successes of, of reduction in lead poisoning over the course of the last 50 years and to set the goal of elimination. We can do this. As we, as we look at the different players that are involved, whether, whether it's healthcare, uh, local government, the education system, several state departments, and, and the federal government and our community partners all across the state, we have all of the pieces. What we're missing today is a, is a coordinated strategic plan with real muscle and resources behind it. And, uh, and that's what we're looking to achieve here is to, is to find the best practices that exist um, any, anywhere around the nation, around uh, the world and, and making progress in this area and to look at it um, very holistically to, to get beyond um, any, to not play favorites with where the source of, of lead poisoning came from, but to recognize that it's all bad and wherever it came from, uh, we need to get to the bottom of it. Understand when lead poisoning has occurred with, with a high degree of accuracy and, 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 and to have a complete look at our population, but then also uh, the response, have a very robust and complete response, and for that response not to be considered to be complete until, the, uh, until we have eliminated the source of the, of the lead poisoning in the first place. And so I'm, I'm very excited not just for the initiative itself, um, but, the, um, but the inference in the title of the commission, which is beyond reduction and all the way to elimination. So let's, let's make today's challenges into tomorrow's success stories. Thank you, Governor. Well, thank you, um, and I'm happy to answer any comments or questions or either one of us, but hopefully you view this as a very positive step forward. Again, thanks for the recommendation, um, and it's also good to co say recommendation completed, but let's go to work now on the, the elimination effort itself through the board. Thank you. Thank you.